We're going to be in Revelation 14. Yep, Revelation 14. And before we get into 14, I just want to kind of revisit 13 and 17. If you remember at 12, we met uh, the great dragon. He's identified for us as Satan. Then we met the beast out of the sea and the beast from the land. We identified them as uh, the Roman Empire and the, uh, the beast from the land was the Roman religion. And then finally, we met in chapter 17, the prostitute who was riding the beast. And we identified her as Rome itself. So all of those bad guys are made in the image of of Satan, particularly the seven heads and ten horns, keep showing up as a kind of a, a easy marker for all those. And we ended chapter thirteen with this calls for wisdom: let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is six, six, six. So we have a, a marking of the ungodly at the end of thirteen. But we're going to turn the tables in 14 and see a marking of the godly. And so uh, the as bad as the characters were in 13, the characters in 14 are equally as good. So we're going to read just the, the first five verses of 14 here in just a second. But notice the, the things that have gone on prior to this. Uh, when we got to the end of the seals ready to open the first trumpets there was 144,000 that were sealed in heaven right before anything else happens wait a minute stop we've got to make sure that the 144,000 have been sealed we're going to see them again uh, the kingdom has already been established satan has been kicked out of heaven that's part of the problem uh, it's good that he can't go to the throne room of god anymore and accuse the brethren but now he's been cast down to the earth where he is pursuing the brethren through means of these persecutors. The, uh, the two beasts and the harlot are all his uh, handiwork to go out and persecute the brethren. So you've still got Satan and the beasts and the prostitute doing their persecution. But again, we're going to stop at the end of a passage that's kind of foreboding and talk about some good things that are going on in the heavenlies. All right, so Revelation 14, we'll just read verses 1 through 5, and then talk a little bit about these 144,000 again. I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind, and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So we have a long list of things that, um, that these 144,000 are. We've met them before, right? At the end of the seals, as we were getting ready for the trumpets, we sectioned these off, and we had a long list, you know, from the tribe of Gad, so many, and from the tribe of uh, Manasseh, so many. We had this long list. Well, now we're going to run into them the second time, and we get a little bit more of a description of who these guys are. So if, if you're from the Jehovah's Witness persuasion, there's 144,000 who will, will be in heaven, and then there are others who will have different reward on the earth. That's their basic premise. Well, the 144,000, if you're going to be one of them, there are certain things that you have to fulfill. Okay. Uh, number one, they all have the name of the Lamb or the name of God on their forehead or on, yeah, this doesn't have their hands, right? Just his father's name and his name written on their foreheads. 
Why do we have that in verse 1 of chapter 14? Why do we get that information right here, right now? Because the very last verse in chapter 13 says that they received the mark of the beast, and the mark of the beast is the number of a man, and the number is 666, right? So we've just had a gigantic marking of all kinds of people who were going to be uh, obedient to Satan and to the beasts. Right? They're going to be in league with Satan and the beasts, and we'll revisit them here in a little bit. But the next verse, right? if, if you don't have chapter headings, which we didn't have until about the 1500s, is very new stuff, uh, then you just keep reading. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast. It is the number of a man. That number is 666. And then I looked, and there was before me the lamb standing on Mount Zion with his 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. So they're, it's just the same thought carried on. You've got one group that's wearing the black hats, and you can easily identify them. Those are the bad guys. And then you have a group that's wearing the white hats, and you can easily identify that those are the good guys. They have their father's name or the name of the lamb written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, like a loud peal of thunder, like harpists playing on their harps. Do you remember any other large, uh, any loud sounds? We've had a couple of them. At the very beginning in chapter 1, John is on the island of Patmos on the Lord's Day, and he's in the Spirit, and he hears this majestic voice from behind him that sounded like trumpets playing. Another time, John hears the thunders. The thunders come rolling in, and John's about to write down what the thunder said. No, don't write that down. That's not for public consumption. So occasionally in the heavenlies, we have these huge sounds, and they're always announcing something really important that's about to happen. Uh, in the good old days, back in, in John's day, right before the king showed up, trumpeters would be in front of him blowing their trumpets. When it was time for the hour of prayer at the temple, there was a guy that went up, and they've actually found this stone, by the way. They've excavated this stone around Temple Mount. The place where the guy would stand, and he would blow that ram's horn, the shofar, and he would blow it so that everybody would know it was the hour of prayer. So they just announced things in that way because they didn't have good cell phone reception and they couldn't get the messages otherwise. So lots of loud noises going on in heaven. So he hears this loud noise and then he hears a new song being sung uh, in verse 3. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So we have that song that we sing. right? They sing in heaven a new song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to hear the glad harp sweetly ring. This is, this is the passage. Do what? Is that what they were singing? I don't think so. <laughs> Nobody knows. And John doesn't even offer to give us a few of the lyric on this one. He doesn't even start like he did with the, the thunders. Uh, but these are the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Okay, So we know that they're human. Right? We can start out with that. We've seen different kinds of angels. We've had singing groups that had all the creatures of heaven and earth and under the earth that were all singing praises. Well, now we've just got this 144,000. Right? He goes on to give us a little bit more description of them. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. There's three or four things that are listed here that I guess if you wanted to come up with, you know, the, the top things you would want in a really holy person, and particularly in that culture, how would you know a really holy person? Well, number one, they are not involved in sexuality. Sexuality is not a problem for them. Uh, for 99% of the population, that lets us out, right? Uh, sexual and happy to be. We, we've never been in that category. But all of these guys, this 144,000, are all virgins. And that would have been something that pointed toward holiness. One of the things Paul says about marriage 
Uh, evidently, he was single. But he says, if, if everybody was like me, you would have more time to think about the things of the Lord. You wouldn't have to think about the things of your mate. Right? We've got to take care of each other. And that's an important, in fact, the same man says, if you don't care for your family, you're worse than an infidel. So, I mean, you've got that responsibility. And God gave us that beautiful union of marriage. But Paul says, if you don't have a wife, you're like me. You're more free. You can travel. You can do whatever you need to do in, in that regard. But he says, you know, if, if you can't, then let every man have his wife and every wife have her husband. So that's, to him, it was a second choice. Uh, is Paul one of the 144,000? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, they are the first fruits among mankind, which probably indicates that they were martyrs. A first fruit was at the time of harvest, you brought in the sheaves, the very first things that you harvested, and brought them into the temple. So before you uh, started making your, your grain, started making your bread, started doing whatever you were going to do with your grain, you brought some to the Lord. The first uh, firstlings of the flock, the ones without any blemish, right? they're the first fruits. They're the very best. So you would bring those to God. So the 144,000 probably were martyrs. So you can go back to chapter, I don't remember, the fifth seal. And you've got all those souls under the altar. And they're saying, how long is it going to be before you avenge us? And then God says, wait a little while longer. You've got some more that have to join your ranks. Maybe those guys were part of the 144,000. Don't know. But again, they're humans. They're uh, martyrs, probably. They're probably males because it says they didn't defile themselves with women. So at least in this description of the 144,000, you don't come up with any girls that are making the cut. So this is all male virgins uh, in the 144,000. And they're blameless. These people always tell the truth. There's not a lie found on their lips. Uh, and where are they? They are with the Lamb. Right? It says they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So in the heavenlies, you have this majestic Lamb who is at the right hand of God. Where would they have been in that scene? Right? You've got the 24 elders gathered around the throne. You've got the four beings. We don't see anybody else in that first scene. The four beings are singing, holy, holy, holy. The 24 elders are throwing down their crowns and saying, you are worthy. And evidently, somewhere, right around the corner, the 144,000. So John doesn't see them in that vision, or he doesn't mention them in that vision. But here it's time for us to just look at them. So all attention is drawn to the 144,000 because we just got finished with a passage that talked about those multitudes of people that we're going to worship the emperor and give in to pressure and be part of the opposition. So they've got the 666. Now you have the 144,000 who are marked with the name of God. Again, 666 is a code, but the 666 is the number of a man. So the comparison is not between a number and the name of God. The comparison is between the name of a man and the name of God. So it could have been, a, again, I think it was, Caesar Nero. If it's Caesar Nero, then the competition is who's bigger, who's badder, who's better, Caesar Nero or God. Caesar Nero says, I am Lord and God. Lord and God says, I am Lord and God. Which one are you going to pick? If you pick Caesar Nero, you're marked by the beast. If, you're, if you choose the Lord God, you're marked by the Lamb and the Lord God. So that's the the opposition to one another. All right. Uh, following this, we get a, a threefold woe. Now, you remember we were waiting on that last woe from the uh, trumpets? Never did exactly figure out which little bit of that passage was the final woe, but here are three more woes uh, or three more exclamations that come from these eagles or angels that are flying in the heavenlies. How many of you have a translation that says there was an eagle that flew and said something? 
Do we about lost that translation? Okay. So it's everybody's got angels. Uh, I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Right, so his qualifications, if you want to be marked with him, are that he created everything. What are Caesar Nero's qualifications? What are the qualifications of the beast? He's got nothing. Right? He's got physical authority. He's running a huge empire. People look to him as a, as a hero of sorts. But as far as accomplishments, worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Now some people come all the way over here to 14 to get the third woe. It doesn't say woe, but it does say you need to make sure that you give honor and glory to God because the hour of his judgment has come. So if, if the third woe is the great judgment that's coming, then here's the segue to kind of moving into that. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Remember last week we looked at chapter 17 and this harlot that's riding on the beast has a cup in her hand and it's full of abominations and it's full of the blood of the saints. Right? So she is satiated with the blood of the saints. But already in chapter 14, before we ever meet her in chapter 17, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. So we have uh, these pronouncements of victory all through 12 and then again in 14. We're going to have more pronouncements of victory as we go through 16, 17. On up, up to the end of the book, uh, there's never a doubt who wins. Right? There's no question. Uh, there's no battle. In fact, when, when we get over to the Battle of Armageddon, we'll take a notice of that. There's a big buildup. Oh, there's going to be a big battle. There is no battle of Armageddon. There's, there's just no battle that happens. It builds up to be a battle, but then there's just no battle because there's nothing that can stand up against God. So worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. If he can do that, you can't mess with him. Right? Go back to Genesis 1. It's a really neat word in, in the Hebrew. Bara. And a lot of the things that are listed in the Genesis account are made. And then God made this. But there are some things that are bara. God created this. There was nothing and he made something out of absolute nothing. Right? Like there's water there. So he separates the land from the water and he calls the dry land earth and he calls the water the seas. Right? He didn't bara, he adjusted he made, but there are some things that weren't there at all, and God bara, he makes things that are not there. Can Nero do that? Can any man do that? Well, of course not. So worship the one who created the heavens and the earth and the seas and the springs of water, because if you don't, you're in the boat with this Babylon who has already been defeated, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. If you're drinking out of her cup, you got problems coming. Okay? The third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. So you've got two cups, right? You've got the, the cup of abomination that the harlot is carrying around with her, drinking the blood of the saints. And then you've got God's cup that is full of the uh, destruction that he's about to wreak on the Roman Empire. Right? So if you are part of the 666 coalition, if you're part of those that are opposing the one who created heavens and earth, and sea, and springs of water, then you're going to be in that cup. You're going to be 
one of those that is reduced to uh, to blood, poured full of the strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise up forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Faithful endurance. It hasn't ended yet. Right? We're pronouncing victory after victory after victory. But what's the problem? The dragon's still there. The beast is still there. Emperor worship is still there. Rome is still there. Right? The persecution hasn't ended but the victory is already being proclaimed. And we, it was last week or two weeks ago that we mentioned that the, the fact that these people were going through persecution was actually something that pointed to the victory of God and the glory of God because Satan had been defeated. Michael and his angels fought against the, the devil and his angels. They couldn't prevail and so they were cast out. Right, so Satan was cast down to earth. He lost the battle. And since he's lost the battle, there's a celebration of the victory, and God's name is already glorified. But these folks are still being persecuted. How can I enjoy the victory of God if I'm still being persecuted? Patient endurance. You stay faithful. You do what God called you to do. You be who God called you to be. Because in the end of things, you know that you're going to have a home with him. You exit here, you go to him. The reason you know that is Satan's already defeated. He, he's got nothing on you. Jesus is, has defeated death on our behalf, so when we die, we can go be with the Lord. There's, no, there's nothing that Satan has other than getting us to renege on our faith. That's all he's got left. If he can get us to deny the faith, that's the only way he wins anything. But if we stay faithful, he loses. As long as we keep the mark of God and don't take the mark of the beast, then our faithful endurance, our patient endurance, is a victory for us and for God's glory. That's what these people needed to know. Right? Now here's... A, it's a passage that I've used in funerals, but it doesn't really fit us. Verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Today in Kenya, they uh, buried a gospel preacher that is very well known around there. He taught in the school, uh, very beloved individual. And this passage fits for Christians who have lived well and died well and, you know, we can celebrate the works that they have done. Their works follow after them. But I think this, in the, the context, is more about persecution. Right? Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Why are they dying? Are they, they just got old and died? The passage is about patient endurance. The passage is about don't take the bark of the beast. The passage is about hang in there. Don't give up. Worship the one who made heaven and earth and the seas and the springs of water. So if you hang in there, it might cost you your life. Back in the, uh, the letters to the seven churches, I want to say Ephesus, the very first one, uh, to the one who overcomes, uh, I will give a crown of life. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Well, you have to be faithful unto death before you get the crown of life. So blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Their works follow after them. What works? They showed up for church, gave regularly, took the Lord's Supper. Those kind of works, maybe. But what about somebody who was preaching the gospel in an atmosphere where it could get them killed? Their works follow after them. So it's, it's a very poignant passage, this first part of 14, that just says, look, 
There's good guys and there's bad guys, and God knows the difference. And if you stay faithful, you can expect a great reward. But if you give in and give up and let Satan pull you away, then you'll be marked. and You'll be marked as his, not as God's. So again, the only thing that Satan has left is the hope that somehow he can pull us away from what God has done for us. And we know better. We know, we know what we've got. We don't want to give it up. Any thoughts about any of that? Okay. You know, they, uh, oh, that's 144,000. Okay, you know, that's 12 tribes of Israel, 144. It seems like that is kind of a, well, I really don't know how to say it, but everything in there is more than 144,000 mm -hmm. in the Bible. That's it. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's actually something we left off the list, isn't it? Uh, we had their, uh, their martyrs and their virgins, and they all tell the truth. We forgot to say they're all Jewish. Yeah. They're all Jewish virgin men who never told a lie. Yeah. That's, that's the list. So why, why would it be listed that way? That's the best question. Uh, why would we have a list of 144,000 who have those attributes? Why, are, why is that something we should expect well, to be like, saved. You know, there's 144,000 of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the 12 tribes of Israel is 144,000. I think these are the same there. guys. No. I think the 144,000 that we met in chapter 7, the, the Jews, I think this is the same bunch. Yeah. But it doesn't say that, but, the, but the number, you know, like you say, it's the same number, so we can kind of jump to that conclusion. Yeah. But anytime you jump to conclusions in Revelation, you may be jumping off a cliff. Uh, just don't ever really know for sure. It seems like oh, all, all, all through the Bible, everything's 144,000. Not 10,000 or 20,000, but it's 144,000. So, I mean, you know, I just... Well, we have a question coming in over the line. So why do the... JW claim that number. Why do they claim the 144,000 number? Um, I haven't done enough reading on why they picked that particular thing, but I'm sure from this passage, one of their main tenets, though, is that, uh, that there will be a place on earth for the rest. If you read their literature, they're, they're, they're not promoting that you and I would ever be one of the 144,000. They're promoting that you and I would have a place to live on the planet that would be a blessed place to live on the planet. Um, you can live forever in paradise on earth is one of the publications that, that they have put out. And, you know, it's um, th there are a, a lot of us that believe that there will be a place of plenty on the earth after the second coming. But... I'm, I'm more of a heavenlies. That's my understanding is that, that we'll be in the heavenlies. But I have a, a very close friend who is a very good scholar who would disagree with me on that one. So uh, I won't disfellowship you if you, if you think that, that something will be going on here on the planet. But, uh, anything else? All right. Love you guys. See you later.